Hi, I'm Jill Gerke, a postdoctoral researcher at The Ohio State University. I'm here to tell you about a paper I completed in collaboration with Christopher Kachanik and Chris Danik titled, The Search for Failed Supernovae with a Large Binocular Telescope, First Candidates. How a massive star ends its life has a huge impact on many things in the universe, and for 50 years astronomers have been trying to understand how exactly massive stars explode as supernovae. You can see here an image of one of the galaxies in our survey taken with the Large Binocular Telescope, showing the recent supernova 2011-DH in the Whirlpool Galaxy. Several lines of observational evidence suggest that 20 to 30 percent of massive stars should form black holes without such a dramatic explosion. It seems that for massive stars, failure is an option, and a very interesting one at that. In a failed supernova, the explosion started when the core of a massive star collapses is not strong enough to overcome the ram pressure from the outer layers of that star. A black hole is formed either with a weak or non-existent transient. With no bright explosion to reveal the death of the star, it is not surprising that we have not yet observed a failed supernova. With our survey for failed supernova with the Large Binocular Telescope on Mount Graham in Arizona, we hope to change that. Using the twin 8.4 meter mirrors you see here, we have been conducting a survey in four optical bands since 2008 of 27 nearby galaxies, where nearby is within about 35 million light years. The observed rate of supernova explosions in these galaxies is roughly one per year, and for plausible rates of failed supernovae, we would expect a failed supernova every three to 10 years. In essence, we searched for stars that disappeared or showed a weak intermediate transient. We used image subtraction to identify all stars that showed a change in brightness comparable to the luminosity of a massive star. Since we don't know what exactly it looks like when a supernova fails, we searched for a star that was consistently detected the first few times it was observed, but was not detected in the final observation of our candidate selection period. As a test case, and an example of the signal we might find, here are the first and last observations of the region around the supernova we saw earlier in the image of the Whirlpool Galaxy. The first observation, taken on March 9, 2008, clearly shows a bright star at the center. And the last observation, taken on April 25, 2014, several years after the supernova, that star is gone. Here is the light curve for supernova 2011-DH, with the observations taken during the supernova removed. The x-axis shows the Julian date, and the y-axis shows the change in brightness in units of 10,000 times the luminosity of the sun. We have subtracted the star's original luminosity, so it starts at zero. After the supernova, it decreased far below 10,000 times the brightness of the sun, which is our limit for a candidate and is marked with the dashed horizontal lines. We see a definite signal of a vanishing star, showing that our methods are valid. We also carry out searches for other possible signatures, such as the weak transients predicted by Love, Grove, and Woosley in 2013. We then examine observations of the candidates over an additional year and eliminate any stars that reappear or continue to vary. At this point, after analyzing the first four years of the survey, we have four final candidates. We go into detail for each of the candidates in the paper, but as an example, here is the light curve and two filters for candidate two, which is in the galaxy NGC 4248, a small companion to NGC 4258. Just like the last light curve we saw, we have subtracted the star's original luminosity, so it starts at zero. Then by about 5,550 days, it has decreased in luminosity by about 10,000 times the brightness of the sun, which again is our limit for a candidate and marked with dashed horizontal lines. After this fading, we could no longer detect the star. All four of our candidates are no longer detected in our most recent observations. We searched for archival data from the Hubble and Spitzer Space Telescopes and were able to find archival observations for three of the four candidates. The archival data make it unlikely that candidate three is a failed supernova. With three firm possible candidates, we calculate what fraction of massive stars we expect to experience a failed supernova. This plot shows the fraction of massive stars that could experience failed supernova along the x-axis, and the y-axis shows the differential probability of a failed supernova fraction. Basically, the higher the curve, the more likely that failed supernova fraction value is, given the corresponding constraints. So if all three of our candidates turn out to be a failed supernova, then about 50% of massive stars will experience a failed supernova. This is likely high, and a more likely possibility is that only one of them turns out to be a real failed supernova. In this case, about 30% of massive stars likely experience a failed supernova. 
and if follow-up eliminates all of our candidates, we place an upper limit at 40%. For comparison, the gray region shows what we expect the failed fraction to be in a model explaining the observed masses of stellar mass black holes. The next step is to observe our four candidates with the Hubble and Spitzer Space Telescopes and to continue to watch them with the LBT as our survey continues. The survey also enables a broad range of other goals, such as measuring the properties of the stars that do explode as supernovae. For more information, please see our paper on the Astro PH Archive. Thank you for listening.